thanks for coming. I'm stoked with this turnout. Thank you for taking the time out of your day to come along to Fishburners tonight for our media Q&A. My name is Amanda. I'm from a company called Prize Big, and I'd love it if you could go and check in uh, on your Facebook while you're sitting here listening to me rabbit on. So we're going to be kicking off now. Um, we're going to be doing a Q&A with some incredible media gatekeepers and superstars for probably the next half an hour, 40 minutes. Um, and then I'm going to open it up to you guys. So you can ask some questions um, and actually chat with them yourselves and, and get some really honest information about how you can get some major media exposure without a big media spend. Um, we've got a bar at the back. I said make sure you do get some drinks and also on your way out, don't forget your gift bags. We've got some fantastic vouchers and um, support in there for small businesses. Um, they're exclusive to this event, so we've got a, a, a legal advice, a free legal session, which is really exciting for anybody who's doing anything, particularly online. Um, we've got a, a bookkeeping gift voucher. Um, there's also a $70 gift voucher to the I Love Fur um, up in North Sydney, so you can get some catering for your event as well. Uh, and Rob Corey's book, Feed a Starving Crowd, which is one of my favourite marketing books of all time. Um, so make sure you grab those on your way out. Now, I'm not sure who here has heard of Prize Pig, but uh, Prize Pig is my baby. And um, it's basically an online platform that partners media with you guys. We use prizes and tap into media competitions, so make sure you check us out, because I think competitions are the best way. You guys can come one up. Um, competitions are the most incredible way of getting media space quick, um, efficiently, effectively, and most importantly, um, with only using products and prizes of getting thousands of dollars in media space. But apparently, there's other ways of getting media aside from competitions. Um, I don't really <laughs> uh, specialise in that space. So I've got people that do. I just wanted to introduce you to our amazing three panellists. So guys, thank you for coming tonight. Get my list. First up, we have Arnett. Now, Arnett is from Rogue Om. It's a men's lifestyle blog and I asked Arnett to come along tonight because he's got an incredible reputation in the industry for brand integration and being really creative. PR companies and small businesses knock down his door because he is brilliant at fusing things. So making your brand look like part of, of his brand, which is what we want. It's about really integrating um, products and services and, and your brands with his. So that's why Arnett is here, because he's got a great insight. So next up we have Miss Mel. Melanie Withnall is a manager director of 2SER, but she has a phenomenal background in radio. Um, if ever you want to talk to anybody in radio, um, Mel is your girl. She not only has been at the ABC for 702 as a producer, she's also been at 2GB, 2UE, and is now heading up um, the radio section at, um, at UTS. So she has an incredible perspective on great interviews. So if you want to get in onto a radio station, if you want to be interviewed on the ABC, she's going to tell us how to do that tonight, about how to make your pitch perfect perfect about how you can really impress and get in touch with the producer to get your story heard on radio stations around the country. And third up, we have Ray. Ray's from Channel 10. Um, Ray's a super producer. So Ray has worked for So You Think You Can Dance, MasterChef, and she's now um, an executive producer on Studio 10. Ray does some really, we do competitions with Studio 10 quite often. It is actually my favourite giveaway spot on Prize Big. I tell everybody who comes in, have you done Channel 10 yet? It's amazing. Um, but also in the editorial space. So Ray's able to bring your band, brand in, not only for infomercials, they do those as well, like the good old morning TV infomercials, but also stretching it out to interviews and demonstrations and things that are really engaging for their audience. And she manipulates um, small businesses and, and helps you to actually get in front of, of the, the mums at home um, watching Studio 10. So that's our panel today. Thanks for coming along, guys. So here's how it's going to work. I'm going to start the ball rolling. I think we're going to break it down and make it really simple and start right at the beginning. So when small businesses... I'm really nervous about this chair. You'll catch me, right? Yeah, oh, I'm littler than everybody. Ooh. Goodness gracious. So when small businesses are thinking about partnering... I'm off it. I'm out. Look how small that is. I would have been like this in a minute. Quality event. So when small businesses are looking at partnering with a media outlet, um, it's terrifying because there's so many. So I'd love to ask you guys about how you would uh, give advice to a small business about selecting a media outlet and, and how they would go about um, c coming about yours and, and getting in touch with you. Arnett, do you want to go first? 
Um, it's really interesting because uh, we get um, uh, bloggers or social media influencers get a lot of emails during the day. So one of the biggest things <laughs> I find that really catches my eyes, if you found my email address on the site and you spelt it correctly because you've emailed me, but then you spell it incorrectly in the introduction, I will flick you to a box and you will sit there for a while. I mean, it's the simplest things, you know, take the time, make it more personal. Um, we get a lot of products get sent and not everything fits in with what we do. Um, it's a men's lifestyle site, so if you send in me, you know, fake tan and lip gloss, it's not gonna, yeah, it's irrelevant. So make sure that, uh, I find that, that make sure your product sits in with what we do. Have a look at our Instagram account, have a look at the Facebook account, have a look at Twitter. Um, I will always make an effort to find a way to find an angle to fit it in. <laughs> you keep dropping down. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's the biggest thing is that introduction, initial introduction makes a massive, massive, and be persistent. Yeah. I've had a Filipino company that does uh, dental work and they've been emailing me for about four weeks now and finally I said yes. So, And it's interesting because he was very consistent. He was still very polite. He was like, you know, I know you're really busy, but it'd be really great to have a conversation. So I said, let's have a Skype conversation. We had a Skype conversation and, you know, and I'm going to the Philippines in January. So. It's, but it's the consistency that makes a difference, and I, for us, it's the politeness as well. Um, I think with radio, it is important to think about the story and does your product fit the audience that you're going for. So if you're someone who listens to Kiss, for instance, listen to, the say, the ads that they have on their clients, listen to the content that they have in their, you know, Kyle and Jackie O show, and think about who is that targeted to because radio content is all about us talking to our listeners. And so if you're going to pitch me something as a radio producer that is not relevant to my audience, I'm not going to run it. And it's even in the case of sometimes radio sales, the radio sales team will even say, I'm not going to take your money because I can't sell this product to the people that you're trying to reach. So um, because they're just not going to buy it. It's just not, they're not in the market for that. So I think that's something to think about. Um, and also, again, like be persistent. And you know, most, in, particularly if you want to get something on a talk-based program, um, those producers are absolutely flat out. They're just working so hard up to deadline. Calling someone at five to nine when a show goes to air at nine o'clock, you're just going to get hung up on and maybe even abused, I don't know. But um, it's like the wrong time to ring. So think about the story, think about particularly the story of your product, when we're not just going to run an ad as an interview. Um, so think about what is the story of your business, what is of interest to that program. That's number one. And number two, pick the time that you call. Um, and do call because there's so many emails that come through and we're not really, radio producers don't really sit in front of their email or their Blackberry, they often just delete. Um, press releases that aren't really of relevance to them so you're actually better off to really think about your pitch, ring them um, and call in on something current too like if there's something in the news that you actually have done in your business or you can contribute then call and say look I can contribute to this story I can help take it further and they'll really appreciate that but not on the deadline <laughs> please. Mel brought up a really good point about picking your story because they're not going to run an ad and I think Ray might reiterate this for me but it's about creating something before people contact you because it needs to work for your brand. It can't be fake tan or it needs to be something that's relevant and it needs to have a story already created. If you have a service, this works as well. Particularly, Mel mentioned if there's something that's happening in the news at that moment that you can jump on the back of. These guys are always looking for more stories. If you run a story on... Give me something. Uh, Perfect. So if you have actually been an innovator, if you have actually been an innovator in your field and you've, um, you're selling products to China or you've created a small business from scratch, that's the time in to ring and to tell your story of that experience, not to try and sell your product, right? You'll still get a mention of your product, but it's in a much more kind of authentic way and listeners aren't going to be turned off. They're going to be like, wow, that was an amazing story. These people sound amazing. I'd like to do business with them. Oh, I couldn't agree with more with everything that, that's been said so far. My role is a little bit different being in television. Um, I totally, you know, the point's about really know your audience. So, for example, I work with Studio 10, Channel 10. People say, what's the demographic? What are your figures? The best 
suggestion I have is watch the show. You'll pretty soon figure out uh, the content that we, we cover, who we're talking to, our panellists, our topics, our guests, etc. Whether your brand or your service or whatever it is, is really right for our demographic. If it's not and you really want to get on the show because you want to meet Ita, that's fine too. That brings it, comes up to Mel's point about create your story, make it fit. The idea of that a producer is just sitting around is the same as you guys. We're all so time poor. I think that's just what, 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 what the world is now. So for me, I would prefer not to get a phone call. We're on air from 8.30 in the morning until 11 o'clock. It is... I won't use profanities. It's very, very busy. Um, so for me, I would much rather get a heads-up email from you. And again, keep it short, keep it succinct, keep it brief. Um, follow, feel free to follow it up with a phone call. Um, so I think first and foremost, know the demographic, know if this is the right place for you to pitch. Relevance and currency is terrific. So again, if there is an innovation report that's come out and you've got, um, you know, we, we get pitched a lot of the, a lot of PR companies will call up and say, I've got this great story about this amazing entrepreneur. She's just, I mean, this woman's come from, you, you, you're laughing, Mel's laughing because she's heard this a thousand times before. Now, I can't tell you, how every person in this room is probably an amazing entrepreneur. You've all started up something. So it's not really the angle, but if you give me something else that I can grab and say, look, based on the fact that there's been an innovation report today, or based on the fact that we've got a new prime minister and he was so entrepreneurial because he started off you know, selling caps and we've got somebody who's selling caps, great angle, great hook. Make our jobs easier, give us the story. Um, bear in mind also um, that there are gatekeepers upon gatekeepers. So if you guys are coming to us and pitching to us with, with an email or a phone call, I've still got to go and pitch it to my team. And I've seen people, we, we have meetings every day in post-production meetings, and people sit in there and they go, um, so I've got this press release, and um, so there's this woman in, um, and they'll go through, and it's, they're, they're trying to, what is the headline? What is the headline? You give us the headline, make, make our job easier. And the other quick thing I wanted to add, and I might be covering too much, is and it's probably easiest with an anecdote. Very recently, I was approached by the Stroke Foundation. Always want to do things like this. We, are, we do have a lot of charity fatigue at the moment, but the Stroke Foundation threw out some stats that were alarming. I pitched this in as, oh my God, do you know that X amount of women are dying more than Canada? No one was interested. Bullshit. People want to slit their wrists. That's awful. That's too depressing. I really wanted to get the story over the line. I got onto their website and I had a look that Chris Bath was one of their ambassadors. Chris Bath hasn't been on television for ages, but everybody knows her. She's got tremendous credibility. So I went back to the PR agency and said, where's Chris Bath? To cut a very long story short, we got Chris Bath on the show. Not only did we gain enormous traction for them, because she's an incredible, incredibly articulate woman, but it was enormous traction for us because the media grabbed hold, and you might have seen it, grabbed hold of the story and said, Chris Bath signing with Channel 10? Yeah. Fantastic. If you have any, any celebrity or any ambassadors or the like, um, push them first. A name, celebrity, celebrity, Chloe Kardashian, where's this perfume? I've seen it. Really? <laughs> okay. That, that is really important, and you raised some incredible points there, Ray, about, about it being relevant. And when they are pitching to you guys, they need to first watch the show. I mean, there's so many, and after, I mean, I used to work at a radio station too, and I know your all of your stories so many times of people pitching that are completely irrelevant. Make sure the demo's right. Um, a story about um, something that is focused on mums might be, might be really great for one radio show, but, but not right for the other. So you need to have a listen um, and make sure that your brand could fit. Do you think that if I called the producer, they'd go, oh, this is perfect, it's going to happen tomorrow? If you're not going to get that reaction, maybe just rework it. Every brand in here has a story that these guys are going to get excited about. You just need to find the hook, because it's not their job to find the hook, and I think that, that's a really important point. We, we've got Sarah, Sarah Harris on the moment from Studio 10, who's very pregnant. And um, we've got somebody else coming on the show who is host of a very large TV show at the moment who's also very pregnant, who has a huge brand and doesn't really need to advertise because she's a very wealthy woman. She wants to come on the show and she wants to spruik a particular thing. I'm not interested. She makes enough money. God bless her. She's great. But that's her interest and that's her sweet spot. Our sweet spot is the fact that she's pregnant, very pregnant, and so is our host. So... 
I've come up with an idea to try and make it creative, and I'm going to give them a challenge. And they're both, she's in the fitness industry. OK, I've given it away. <laughs> so we're going to do a little obstacle course with dramatic music. We've got a segment that is entertaining on Studio 10. That will probably end up on YouTube, because there we'll have this particular woman in heels running around next to Sarah Harris, <laughs> etc. Yeah. It's going to gain traction. Now, that was my idea. It's not genius. But it's the point I'm trying to make is that try and find that hook. I, I can pitch that in. If I go in and say, well, so-and-so is coming in and she's pitching Weight Watchers and she's really good and it's really great and people feel better and they've lost. Really? But if this person has, a, we can try and get that hook, that creative angle, it's going to get traction for you guys and for us. Mm. And can I just add something Please. on that as well, which was, um, you know, when I worked at the ABC, we were obviously quite reluctant to get those pictures because there is that very clear line about commercial and non-commercial. Um, but one of the things I used to always find was we did have a spot on my program, I worked on mornings, where we talked about small business. And often I would get the idea and I would call a small business, like I would do my own research and I would find a company and I would ring them. And they would just flat out say no because I think they might have thought I was calling from Four Corners or something, <laughs> you know. And just to... And, you know, that was actually a missed opportunity in terms of them, you know, we didn't want to talk about their business. We actually wanted to talk about, you know, something else that maybe they had done. But again, it's an opportunity for you to come on. And the people that did take that opportunity up often then became commentators. Because if you're good talent, if we as a producer put you in our contact book as being someone who is a good talker, who has stories to tell, who isn't just, you know, selling a product, who's actually engaging with our audience and got lots of good things to say, then I might call you again. You know, we had very tight turnarounds in breakfast radio. You have incredibly tight turnarounds. So if you're in my contact book as someone who's good, then I might come to you again. And then other media, media listen to other media and then they'll pick that up. And then now it's going to go on social media and it's going to get shared and then you're going to get Twitter followers and you... You can see how it kind of snowballs. Mm -hmm. So don't be afraid if you get that call, actually listen to the pitch from whoever's ringing, whether it's a blogger or you know, a magazine or a newspaper, whatever, have a listen to the pitch and actually think, could I talk about this? And often people go, oh, I'm not an expert. Well, I don't need you to be an expert. I just need you to know more about it than most of my listeners. You know, Because even if you say something that people disagree with, they're gonna call in and interact and it's gonna be great radio content, so. Thanks, Mel. Now, we were talking about what, how, what people should do and shouldn't do when they're contacting you, but I'd like to just take it back a, a step, and, and I hope you guys are excited by this. This might be helpful. But how do people even get in contact with you? I mean, you guys are gatekeepers. If I called, if I called Channel 10 and I said, Hi, my name's Amanda. I've got an amazing business. I really want to promote it on Channel 10 or, or Studio 10. Chances are I might get rerouted to the sales department um, or somebody who has nothing to do with your section. Um, and the same with on, online, Arnett. I, I wonder if there's often on, on websites you'll see an info address. Um, how do people actually find you guys and, and get in contact with you? Arnett, did you want to take that first? We used to have an info address and I found that a lot of people were too scared to send an email because they thought it just went into sort of the nether, Netherland. Mm. Um, so I put my own email, my personal email address on there, which the box keeps getting for. <laughs> you never send Arnett an email, it just bounces back. Don't take it personally if you no, send no, it No, no, I fixed that. I fixed that now. Um, but the, the biggest thing is like, Look, on Instagram, there's always a place for you to click on, go to the website, click through. And on, on, our, on the Rocom site, it's got what we're about mm -hmm. and what we can do for you as well. Right. And most of the times now, a lot of brands who don't come from a PR company, because the PR companies are great at sort of pitching uh, an idea or they're great at annoying you with sort of product. Um, what, I, what they normally will do is they'll say, can you send us your media kit? Mm -hmm. And I'll send my media kit. And then they can figure out from then you know, how or why they fit in with what we do. Mm -hmm. And it makes it a lot easier because then they rework, they pitch a lot of times, and by the time they get back to us, I'm like, okay, cool, what for you? Is that something you think people should look at when they are contacting to ask for the media kit to get the details or to just engage and, and watch your website and follow your Instagram? A bit of both, maybe? Yeah, a bit of both makes a message because I, I watch and see who follows, mm -hmm. and then I'll wait and see. A lot of times brands will follow me, and mm -hmm. I'll, I'll think, you're going to send me an email in a couple of days, I'm going to wait and see what happens. Sure enough. And they send me an email, and it's like, okay, that's great but are you only just following me because you want me to share what you're talking about? So there's got to be a sort of give-give situation in the... That's interesting that Arnett is actually the editor and he's the one that's looking at that Instagram. So I wonder, all the brands and, and media outlets that you follow for your brands, you should be doing this, by the way, following heaps of media outlets so they see your name coming up. Um, 
how many how many people are actually doing that and and probably didn't even realize that it's actually some gatekeepers and decision makers that are on the other end of that phone yeah it's important okay no i'm gonna actually throw it back to you amanda mm -hmm. how did we connect because she is yeah. Uh, She's I've, awesome. I've been raving on to her already tonight. I mean, I think, you know, for, for, for us personally on, on Studio 10, I, I see the, the queues of people lining up for the living room uh, and they desperately want to get on the show, but it's, you know, four o'clock in the afternoon and they pre record the living room and they've got this gorgeous looking audience and so on. We struggle to get audience. We're asking them to be there often at 8, 7.30 in the morning, stay at 11. Often we do pre records, post records or whatever. Um, so we need prizes. We need people to come to our show. And the only way we're going to, and we're a studio audience, the only way we're going to get bums on seats is by getting, uh, bribing them with great prizes, which fortunately is why Amanda and I have developed this, uh, um, I, this, is, this is, I adore her to pieces, because she makes my life so much easier. She'll connect us with the right prices, prizes or, or, and so on. But I can't recall how we, how you got, I know you sent us chocolate, and that was... A I do, I love sending chocolate. But how, do you opening doors? How, yeah, you I, I find LinkedIn works really say, well yeah. for me. And it's important because all different media outlets that you're going to come across, radio, magazines, TV, websites, blogs, the people that are the people that you need to be talking to, across all the different mediums have different job titles. So that's something that's quite quite hard to wrap your head around, like um, radio, they're often tactics managers um, that are the ones that do the giveaways, whereas a producer is a, pretty much a producer. But LinkedIn is, is an amazing resource to get, in, get into and, um, and again, follow, follow these people and engage them um, through social media. Like you mentioned Instagram, and, and I feel like Instagram's a really great space for people that are product-based um, to engage with, with media outlets, particularly online, because they will see your products before they hear a knock at the door of you asking for something. So it's just a little, a gentle way of, of introducing. I want to talk about interviews, because hands up who is more, um, who doesn't have a tangible product. Hands up who's service or app or online or, or something. Right, about half of you. Okay, that's really interesting. So it's easy when you've got a product, because call me and we'll sort it out. We get amazing prizes and that, that's a really a quick and easy win. However, service base are a little more difficult, particularly if you're, say, a bookkeeper and there's how many other bookkeepers or you're a, a legal legal or, or you, you're creating an app and there's so many different apps that the marketplace is pretty cluttered. Um, I think that, that it's important for, for people to know what they, how, how they can actually be pitching an interview and, and why they're important. And, um, and getting through e emailing, really break it down. Apps are really interesting because um, um, at the moment we're just about to do something with GoCatch. So what the PR company has done is they've come to us and said, GoCatch are going to give you $300. It's on the app and you just use it and share it whenever you use it. Or Clip, which is a new way of paying for, like if you're at a bar, that your whatever orders you do are put on the Clip app and you just use, it's attached to your credit card so you don't have to go up to the bar and try and find someone to pay. So they just said, oh, we've put $500 on the Clip app, on it, here you go, go away to the bar and sort of use it. So ways that we can interact with the app are really great because then we share it on social media. I, I'll pop it up and go, this is really good. You know, what a great way of using it. I, I found a place to eat at and I just clicked on it. And so interacting or I, I get a lot of apps at, uh, approaching me saying, we're just about to launch. Can you test it out for us? Which is a really interesting way of, of saying, you know, can we get your feedback for nothing? But I will do, I'll, I'll download it and have a look. And if I think it's interesting, I'll email back and say, this is really nice, actually. Can you send us more information? Or when does it go live? Because I'd like to share it. Who was it that had the dating app that's about to launch? Boom. Oh, cool. I was at a Zeusk event last night. And what they did was they brought an author out from America who wrote about relationships. I mean, probably not in the budget. But, you know, <laughs> there's interesting ways to, you know, to sort of connect it together. It's about making a story irresistible, Mel. Have you got yeah, something? well, I was just going to say, like, the dating app's a great example. The story there, for me, could be what is it about your app that makes it different to everyone else? Like, if it is actually... Because people are quite interested in this, you know, new world of, you know, apps and all the things they can do and how they work and what, how it's going to benefit them. So if you can actually tell me what the unique story is about your app, then that's something that I'm going to be interested in. And how many, you know articles do you read that are talking about what an app does and you know or something related to tinder or something you know like so tell me what it is your app does what's unique about it as a dating app and that's potentially is an angle for a story 
Mm. Yeah, I, I totally agree with Mel. I think it's, it, it, I think that kind of it's interesting because as we're talking, we're all coming back to the same thing. It's about making it really relevant. And, you know, sometimes I think in, in business, um, we tend to be so focused on our, on our brand, on our product and our service. This is what it does. It is so unique. It's so amazing. And I think we kind of sometimes get almost too close to it. And we need to sort of step back sometimes and just almost think like a producer. What is going to make them? What is going to come mm. through? Mm. Why is this going to get on air? So there's a dating app. So pitch something like, this is an amazing dating app. I've got two people who've just met, they've got engaged, or something of the like. That's they a good story. Come on, yeah. yeah, they want to come on the show, they want to talk about it. If I pitch that in, we'll sit around a table in a creative meeting, which is usually the most inappropriate hour of my day. But what's great is that we bounce off each other. Before you know it, we've got John O'Connor, who's now coming in as a Cupid topless, and it's all just very inappropriate and fabulous. But, you know, again, and for me it comes back to, and, and our show is a bit irreverent, but... It's about making it, making it relevant and cutting through. Um, what makes your app different? And what makes your app different might be this piece of technology that you've got. Um, somebody at the moment is, is, is giving some fantastic LG TVs away on our show next week. And she sent me a whole lot of texts and specs. And I turned around and I was quite upfront and, and candid and I said, nobody gives a shit. I don't know what upscaling means and I work in television. I think it means it, it looks better. But you have to make it relevant. Make it relevant to me. I live in an apartment, for example. Well, she says, yeah, well, this TV is great for an apartment. Fantastic. So make it, make, you, know, the, the, you know, the new TV for apartment living or whatever it is. So make, just try and make it, make it relevant. Um, and again, comes back to really trying to make a producer's life easier. Don't be afraid to think outside the square. Don't be afraid to be creative. Because once you've started that conversation, the producer might go, oh my God, oh my God, okay, but what if we did this? And then you might say, well, funny you should say that because I've got that ring to give away. And in fact, my cousin, sister's brother's auntie's mother's nephew is getting married. <laughs> so let's come on the show and do the wedding on the show. Right, thank you. And what about receiving gifts? And I'm sure... I've done it for a lot of clients and I'm sure you guys maybe... Who sent something to a media outlet or packaged something up fun that you thought that might get you some press? Who's done that? Two of you. Okay. What? What do you... Come on. You've got to impress them. Send something fun. I want to know, when you get some stuff, you must get stuff all the time, aren't it? I imagine Channel 10's filling up a lot as well. My bathroom cupboard is like sale of the frigging century. It is... Do you mind putting my cupboard? And, and I love... Sorry. Okay. I, I absolutely love it. So, yes, I love, I'm sure you do too. Yeah, we I, get... I, uh, yeah, we love gifts. Yeah. So, how do they go from standing at the post office for half an hour, sending something to you, going... Like this, to cutting through and actually getting on your Instagram. What's, what goes in the middle there? The best way I find um, that sort of gets to us is I get an email saying, can I please get your address? Mm -hmm. Obvious. Uh, yeah, you obviously. Like, which is, yeah. Um, but then they send a courier because then you've got to make sure you <laughs> sign for it. So uh -huh. if you send it to a post office, sometimes I, I won't pick it up for, you know. Yeah. No one has time to go to the post office. That's a really practical tip. Right. Um, and they'll say, the, you know, the career is going to come around at this time. I sign for it. I mean, they don't always work. Um, Star Trek. Don't use Star Trek. Um, <laughs> God bless them. I tweeted at Australia Post today, yeah, and said, fix up your crap delivery company. Um, change the world. Yeah, change the world. You have to. Um, but that was, that's the biggest thing is, like, make it stand out. Or oh, it has to be relevant still as well, you know, like, um, you know, new shoes uh, and... And what we'll do is with the product, when it comes in, I'll shoot it straight away and post it on Instagram because it's the okay. quickest way. And then sometimes I forget to do a story about it. So we get a gentle reminder saying, did you like it? Is it okay? If we, could we send you some more information to put a story up? And then we'll go, okay, we'll figure out a way of editorially fit it in with the, what, what, what we shoot in or the mm. stories. Because we have certain topics on certain days. So okay. make it exciting. I think it's easier maybe for you um, when people are sending stuff directly yeah. to you and directly to editors because they are, you know they're going to receive it. But whereas when it comes to talent, if you want talent to be Instagramming or sending something, often you would send that to a producer or something. Would you mind talking about how to I access think, you guys? Well, the last time that um, I was being sent gifts, um, I was at the ABC, which had a gift policy which meant we couldn't receive them. So you could send something as lovely and there were some beautiful gifts that... Um, Either, you know, we would send back or we would donate to St Vincent de Paul because anything that you get has to be declared because of that commercial independence of the ABC. So it's probably not worth sending it, you know, because as lovely as it is, 
They just, we, you just can't accept it. So send all of them to me. So you yeah. can send them. One Saunders Street. And, yeah. yeah. Um, no, but do, you know, that's the thing of like, use your resources wisely um, because it can't go the other way. I mean, people did bring, you know, would bring things in if they came in and um, sometimes if it was food, we could maybe eat it, but generally, because <laughs> quickly, no, we never did that. We declared everything um, because yeah, it is that, that thing, so. Yeah, just be careful. No, I, I know we, we, we've got a, we've got a, um, a, a, and we can maybe even touch on advertorial versus editorial. But we've got a, a lady coming in with a particular product, which she has designed and developed, and, and it's a really cool product. It's a little unusual, which is probably what makes it what makes it so good. But she's not only sent one to myself and to the manager of sales, um, who then came up to me and was like, "Oh my God, have you tried this? It is insane. It is brilliant." But she's also sent little samples to our hosts. Mm. And if it's packaged beautifully to Ida Buttrose and Sarah Harrison, it's not, a, it's not hard to find out their names. They're on TV every <laughs> single day with a little note that's a personal note saying, hey, guys, big fan of the show. I'm coming on the show next week. Have a try of the See What You Think, for example. Um, that you know, often, often gets traction as, as well. Um, so yeah, I, I think, you know, and, and again, it's difficult. I know you, you were saying you were a book a, a bookkeeping space or dating. I mean, it's tricky to, you know, to, to do those sorts of things. But gifts for commercial television, it always reminds me, and, and I don't know whether this is an urban myth or not, but I know with um, Krispy Kreme, and correct me if mm -hmm, I'm yeah, incorrect, Krispy Kreme never did a, spent a cent on marketing. All they did was send those incredibly delicious, wonderful, mouth-watering donuts to radio stations and television stations who would receive these donuts, open them, take one bite, and the next thing they had thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of free publicity because if you've ever eaten a Krispy Kreme, you can't not talk about it. Yeah. So yeah, I was at Nova when they did that. They used to send 10 boxes every Monday. Be like, Monday's diet day. No. Uh, <laughs> genius. It was a genius move. Now, um, Ray just mentioned avatorial versus editorial. Hands up if you know what she's talking about. I think we need a refresh. Do you mind? Oh, look, I, I, in, in essence, um, we've all watched, you've know, been watching Bert Newton and God knows, you know, all the, the morning shows for years and years. And the advertorials are those notorious sort of four minute um, yell and sells, selling mops, selling, you know, eye creams, miracle eye creams, and, and, and all sorts of things. And I think for a long time they, they did work, and that period of time I think is. is is, is coming to an end. I think there's still, a, you know, a direct advertising. There, there is a space for. But I think people have the, you know, the internet nowadays, and I think they're able to say, look, I really need a vacuum cleaner. I'm going to go on choice. I'm going to subscribe. I'm going to have a look which vacuum cleaner is best. So, I think what we're finding is we've had to greatly subsidise our advertorial content. Um, we fill six advertorials a day. We're very nice to advertorial clients because they do keep the lights on, as we say. As frustrating as it is, it is quite jarring in the middle of content. The other thing is that people are not necessarily watching ads. So in terms of advertising spend, people are not really paying for spots and dots anymore. So the best way forward really is to try and integrate your brand, your product, or your service within the body, within the content of a show. Adrenaline did it beautifully in The Bachelor. Um, you can see the cars in The Bachelor or in MasterChef. You can see Coles is everywhere. Um, they pay big bucks for those and those are, those are huge clients. But there are other ways of trying to, as I start off by saying, by thinking outside the square of trying to get your product across. You know the shows that are coming up in TV, whether it's radio or the like. Um, so the advertorial is paid content, and for our show in particular, and I think the same with, um, with the other morning shows, there is a particular host. What we have tried to do is we pre-record all John O'Coleman's links, sorry, we pre-record all the advertorials, but all his links are done live in the studio. So we pre-record them in four different outfits, which means that every single day he'll always do his links live, he'll clear frame and he'll walk into the shot. What this means is if we're talking about Mark Latham's eruption on the verdict last night, John O'Coleman can throw and say, good God, Mark Latham, what a crazy guy, but I'll tell you who's not crazy, it's Margot. And in he goes into that shot. And that does help us because people, you know, it's not the here's Moira yeah. sort of thing. So. Uh, the editorial is quite interesting, I'll very quickly explain. When we started Studio 10, we decided we would charge many thousands of dollars for editorial because you were essentially getting, coming on the show, what, what's your business, for example? Oh, we build, uh, we're a tech startup that is transforming the way small businesses do their digital presence. 
Okay, it's a, it's a, it's a little highbrow to, to, to grab hold of. But for example... Um, if superheroes at the front here, superheroes do domestic services. They come and clean your house. Is that kind of a bit better? Brilliant. So, yeah. so that's a great four minutes sort of, you know, get John on, talk about it. You, you make the producer's life easy, get some great vision. But there are ways of doing an editorial, so, and it's not that much more expensive, where you actually come on the show and we say, look, what makes your product different is that we do all our cleaning in high heels. It's amazing. I'm just saying. I'm sure you don't. <laughs> well, there's an idea. Um, um, but, but what we'll do then is they will pay slightly more, but they'll come on the show and we will make this as an editorial. So you will have the likes of Ida Buttrose and Sarah Harris and who knows who this, you know, the fifth panellist is on the day. So it's always worth asking, but again, pitch us the story. Pitch us the story. Come up with an idea. Mm -hmm. um, so it goes through the editorial team rather than the sales department. And that is the case across every single media outlet that you're going to come across. Make sure you pitch to the, to the editorial guys. And if there is something in there where they think there might be a sales integration, it's going to be a lot, lot, lot less than had you have just gone straight through the sales department. And that integration is really important for your brands, as Ray was saying, and for no the one, no one is making no one is making crazy money in television. Let's not kid ourselves. No one is making huge amounts of money. So don't feel as though you're punching above your weight. You're not. Mm. Give it a crack. Give it a crack. Send something in. Pitch something. You just never know. We might be having crazy week. We might be, ha be having 1984 week. We do, certainly do some weird things on our show. So mm. give it a crack. Now, when you talk about the big guys, Ray, I wanted to ask Mel, at a community radio station, it's a really great way for people to, if, I mean, gosh, go for both, I say. Yeah. <laughs> but if you want to get started out, community is a gentle way of doing that. It is, and I think, too, because, because we're run as not-for-profits and um, a station like mine, a lot of our content is done by volunteers. We only employ staff to do, you know, I guess what I call the boring jobs, i.e., you know, managing the station doing the audit, you know, no one's going to volunteer to do that. Um, so, but we do, um, our costs are lower, so therefore our, the ad spend to get on our station is a bit lower and you're still reaching a considerable audience and it's the same for many of the different community radio stations in Sydney. So it is worth having that conversation. Um, there's some great stories, I think um, we were sort of looking through, because the station was 35, so we were going through a lot of historical stuff and I think Menu Log actually started off advertising mm. with 2SER. Like, that is a huge company. But they obviously started small and thought, well, let's reach these people. Um, and we are seeing that with some of our clients that we've worked with over time, that, you know, it's really good fit for small business. You're getting um, ads that don't sound like ads because we do, we call them sponsorship um, under the Broadcast Services Act and they're just a bit less of a hard sell. So. And you're kind of getting that vibe because you're partnering with the community. So it's something to think about because it is that little bit cheaper. But again, check that the demographics work for you. Check that it's going to work with your product. Um, but it is something to consider. But by all means, you've got to get your, your products out there. So look across all of that media because you would be surprised um, sometimes what the figures are. You know, for you to advertise. Yeah, with social media influencers as well. And like, if I like a product, I will share it with other pe other bloggers that I know. And you know, I've got um, other bloggers that have uh, eighty to one hundred thousand. Like w with Rogon, we're only hitting about eighty five thousand because guys aren't as you know quick to the to the mark. But um, I know other f fashion bloggers or lifestyle bloggers that have you know one hundred fifty thousand readers click over a month. And by sh by approaching us, I will go. This doesn't fit with me, but I will introduce you to blah, 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 um, and I'll do an email introduction, and a lot of times the stories then get carried on and yeah. get shared, and it makes a massive difference. And before we go to questions, I hope you guys have written some ideas down. What's something that you've had approached from startups? What are startups making mistakes with, and, and how can they fix it when they're uh -huh. contacting you? Can I read an email I got last night? <laughs> oh, here it is. Oh, no, that's not it. Uh, basically said, we think you should use us because we're really good and you need our help. Oh. Um, so... Like, call immediately. Yeah, I'm going to call them immediately. Um, <laughs> no, I sent it to another mailbox. <laughs> I went, yeah, I'll think about you. But it's the same thing. It's just the approach makes a massive difference. I can't stress that enough. I think the first sentence of any contact in an email should have nothing about you. Yes. Would you agree? Yeah, yeah it's about, about the other person. Yeah, nothing yeah. about you. They'll get to it if they're interested. Have I got a story for you? Did you know, fun yeah. fact, has nothing to do with your product, but it has a precarious link that you can tie in later on down the email? Gosh, even yeah. the first couple of sentences, get two away and get, keep their interest. You know. Sometimes, sometimes even just, sometimes even the, I mean, you 
Something pops up, you know, your little screen at the bottom there. You can kind of see straight away, oh, Jesus, I don't have time for this and I'll just delete it. But if it's a really catchy, even just in the headline and the subject matter, and I, sometimes I spend more time thinking about that headline than I do of the actual content of the email. Um, if I want to get somebody's attention, in fact, our hosts are notorious for not reading their emails and notorious not for not reading their briefing notes, which is infuriating when you've spent so much time working on something. So sometimes I will write the most outrageous headlines in an email just to get their attention because I know they'll read it. Um, so I think that's something to think about. And I think also, you know, if you're emailing and you know, for example, we're in Sydney there's, and you're in Sydney, there's nothing, you know, to stop you from saying, hey, you know, you know, and it's pouring with rain or happy Monday, hope you had a good weekend or hope you're surviving the weather or happy Melbourne Cup Day or happy Halloween or, um, you know, writing to you from, you know, or got your details from or... So it doesn't feel as though it's... Uh, you know, a, a hard sell straight away. So I think that's really good advice. I think because you guys are so big, do you think that sometimes it's intimidating, intimidating writing emails? So, I mean, some people might be nervous to create that personal connection, but there's people reading that email. People are people, exactly. right? That's what it all comes down to. Exactly. And everyone's looking for something interesting, you know, and if you can make it interesting and just not sending that generic... You know, particularly if you have targeted to an audience, that yeah. generic, like, hi. Blah, block blah, out blah, the blah, BCC blah. email addresses if you're sending it. Oh, yeah. Oh, I get so many, and it's like, obviously, you've sent a block email, and everyone else's email address is in that list. Awesome. That's great. Yeah. But it's very useful, yeah. like, you know, as a journalist to get all those emails. So, you know, <laughs> oh, yeah. um, I've saved a lot of yeah. them. But I think it's that thing, like, you can tell straight away that it's a generic, that it's just an ad, that there's nothing of interest to my audience and, yeah, delete. Yeah, I think, I think coming back just full circle to where we started was really sort of know your demographic, really know who you're talking to. The pitch mm -hmm. you're going to give are not the pitch you're going to give me is probably quite different. So I think sort of, you know, even just craft your email slightly differently. It's like you guys know when you're looking for jobs, your CV. Your CV would kind of change according to who you were trying to get. The, well, mine did anyway. Mm -hmm. I hope yours did. <laughs> you kind of, you, you know, you kind of tailor your CV. If it were more of a technical job, you kind of highlight those things. So think about the demographic, how this is going to work for radio, which is just theatre of the mind versus how it's going to work for TV. Tell me what images you've got. You know, tell, you know, make it easy for the producers. Make it easy for us. Um, don't let us have to. The more, you know, we, we're just too time poor to think. So. And can I just say too, like, you, you all know this because you've all had to pitch this idea to an investor or to family and friends or you can do the headline. You can all sum up your business, your product, your service in that one sentence. So, you know, you can do it to us. The elevator pitch, yeah, I think people get really nervous and they think, oh, I'm contacting the media and I can't, you know, I don't know what to say. You, you know, you know, and you know if it's the right match for you or not. It's really time consuming because you need to show these media outlets that you care about them and you've taken the time to actually craft something that's specially for them. And I know as small business owners and, and startups, time is of the essence, like you guys are busy. But if you do one pitch a month, and craft it really well, one every fortnight, then you're gonna get a better hit rate than if you send out an email with a hey there, and a blanket uh, press release, or just a few paragraphs about your brand and an offer to interview you, you're gonna get a better hit rate off sending one email a month than you would if you sent that generic email out to 100 media outlets. Yeah. So, just take, it's probably take the same amount of time to do both of them, so you don't have to go too big, too quick, just, just pick one, just pick Studio 10 or Rogue Om or 2SER. Because everyone, like, this is the thing you've got to remember, we all want to feel special, like I know I want to feel like I'm an important blogger. Mm. And so if I feel like you've taken the time out to say, you know, hey, just saw your Instagram post about blah, 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 really cool shoes, I think I might ch check it out. I'll go, oh, okay. How do they know yeah. that? Yeah, how do they know that? That's really cool. <laughs> and you asked before about mistakes that people make. Yes. I think sometimes it's around the timing that you choose to contact the media organisation mm. as well. Like, you actually don't, you know, maybe if you're just trying to get media coverage because your business is new and it's launched, that's probably not the time to go for an interview because you don't really have much to say about the business at that point unless it's like a new interesting idea. So just think about where you are at the stage of your business cycle and, you know, is it actually better to wait? Because you'll also only get one chance to do that interview yeah, right. um, unless you're taking out campaigns or editorial or you've got that really unique product and you can do something really creative. One chance, go with a bang. Yeah. Have out your mic. 
Are you ready for Q&A? Who's got some questions? Hi, how are you? My name is Edwina and I'm a founder of Vivify Textile. I have a question for you in regards to a moment where you were mentioning um, particular network, they don't accept any gift and particular one they do. So I just wanted to ask you, is there a, a, like an, an obvious rule, don't send gift to this, this channel or this, this media or you know, these are you know, welcome to accept, that kind of thing? It's general, I mean, the ABC has very strict gift policies for staff. Um, so, and they're also, because in their charter they are the non-commercial network, so when they're, they're, there are rules around how they can address brand names, what you can do, um, so you don't want to be sending them the gifts because they, they just, they can't accept them, um, or they're going to put them on a registry, or they're just going to go, well that's clearly just a commercial pitch. You have to go with the story. Um, even to the point where we would declare if we were given um, theatre tickets, you know, and as a producer that we need to go to stuff, we need to see it. But if I went and saw a show and then we did a story about that show, like interviewed one of the stars of it or something, um, we had to declare that we'd actually been and there's a register, so it's very transparent. And it's similar with community radio, but not, as, not to the same extent. Yeah. Um, whereas in commercial radio, like, I ate the Krispy Kremes and I talked about them on air and, you know, all of that stuff because it's, it's commercial media. So it's very different. So there's more of a room for yeah. that. The, the, just not so much in terms of the gifts, but definitely the ABC because, you know, they're obviously the compliance is very different to commercial television. But I certainly know in the last... We've been on air as of next Wednesday, two years, but I certainly know with Studio 10 we've had to put things in place. So, for example, uh, I did a, a deal with Gloria Jeans. We now have a barista on set and it's all very integrated and we get our coffee and so on and so on. But we have to make sure that we own that by having a Gloria Jeans logo and super we, and in our credit roll, which says we have commercial arrangements with. But the other thing to say is, you know, don't just send a random gift because that's just a bit creepy. So, <laughs> um, shoot through an email and just say, hey, um, love the show, got this great idea, this great concept, great product, great service, whatever, hope you don't mind, um, can, you, uh, can you send me, you know, your, 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 or is your street address such and such, or who's the best person to send it through to? Start a conversation, start a conversation. That's the best way forward, because if somebody turns up randomly, we have the standard joke in our office, it's like, is it ticking? So... Thank and you. even in um, commercial, when I worked in commercial radio, because of the pro high profile of the announcers, sometimes the food, we couldn't eat it in case maybe oh, wow. it was poisoned. So, yeah, it was very devastating. Not the Krispy Kremes. It wasn't the Krispy Kremes. They, they overcame everything. <laughs> but, you know, and it was a real shame because I remember you get some stuff and you'd just be like, this looks delicious and you'd you have to put it in the bin because you didn't know. I think a note too if you want to send something to a celebrity. So one of the hosts or a radio announcer that is in your area that you think one of the brecky guys you can send it to, chances are it's going to hit their desk or go to their personal assistant. Um, but they may never hear from you again. And um, as Ray was saying, they often don't check their emails. So I recommend get on social media. So why don't you take a photo of what you're sending them and tag them in on Instagram and say, hey, Sarah Harris, this is the post for you today. I'm really excited to hear what you think. And then a few days later, a week later, Australia Post, not Star Trek. Um, you can follow up, do a little post and, and, and say, hey, on Instagram, take a photo of something unwrapped, do a some different image or something and tag Sarah in it and be like, we're busting to hear from you. Make it really engaging and, um, and chances are they'll prompt them to retweet because they're busy too. So that's a great way of getting celebrities to talk about your products and um, more so than imagine if somebody just sent you something and then you never heard from them again. So you can see that there's a difference there. Yeah. Questions? Anybody else? I'm kind of hiding behind this pole. Um, hi, so my name's Anika, thank you. It's been really interesting. Um, my question is, I'd love to know what the most interesting, quirky, weird, memorable um, pitch has been that has been delivered to you that's been effective. Most recently was a wheelchair, which I couldn't do as a giveaway, it was a bit odd. Um, but, uh, but ironically, from the same company, um, somebody offered us a massage chair, which was 
bizarre. It was for one. It was it was a massage chair for one person, um, and in fact, it wasn't so much the pitch, but it was more more the product. But what we did with that massage chair, we had so much fun with it. Every play on, I mean, he sent us a very expensive. We we called it Colonel Mustard because it was a mustard colour, and it did everything. I mean, it massaged your from your earlobes to your toes. You know, um, so again, you know, he he got the product.